I would tell you that I was Kaylee's best friend, but I'm pretty sure a lot of people in this room would want to say the same thing. I've met quite a few people because of her and have some good relationships. So somehow, she continues to be an amazing friend. Hi, and welcome back to Red Rum Media. I'm your host, Kay. Today, we're going to be talking about the case of Kaylee Mendati. The last weekend of October was supposed to be fun. 19-year-old Kaylee Mandati went to the Mala Luna Music Festival with her then 22-year-old boyfriend, Mark Howerton. Although it's unclear exactly what happened that fateful weekend, there are some very telling and even haunting details that have recently come to light. Kaylee had her whole life ahead of her when it was tragically ripped away from her one frightening Halloween weekend in 2017. The outgoing Trinity cheerleader was allegedly trying to end her volatile relationship with her boyfriend, Mark, around the time that she unexpectedly died. Mark told law enforcement that they had known each other for about eight months prior, but they had only been dating for about a month. It's very clear that those who knew Kaylee grew to love Kaylee very quickly. Although I might not please everybody, I hope that at some point, I make you happy. And I'm sure after the fact, I'm going to think of way better words to have said today. But she is a complex person, so there's a thousand ways to describe her. She's impacted us all so differently. So, where do we begin? One of Kaylee's sorority sisters paid tribute to her by saying, My hope is that when people think of Kaylee, they think of strength, kindness, and intelligence. I hope they realize that although she was beautiful, she was so much more. She will truly be a part of this campus, and her impact on people was astounding. Another sorority sister told a local media outlet, if you needed her, she would always be the first one knocking on your door or calling you. She would do anything for other people. She was incredible. Sources close to both sides of the case have explained how the relationship was quite violent from what appears to be the very beginning. At times, it seems as if Mark was maybe nice to Kaylee, but that appears to have been very short-lived or maybe only in public. Months after Kaylee's mysterious death, there were still very little answers, although early signs from the university suggested Mark may have been involved all along. Months went by, and although Kaylee's autopsy was completed relatively quickly, it took until February of the following year for an arrest affidavit to be filed with the courts, seeking multiple charges against Mark in the death of Kaylee. At this time, a cause of death was finally revealed, as it was stated in both the arrest affidavits that were filed in Bexar County, Texas. Rumors started to swirl on campus as the days drug on with very little information. The case finally headed to court in December of 2019. Mark Howerton was facing multiple charges relating to their relationship, including the untimely death of Kaylee. Unfortunately, the trial ended in a hung jury, but that doesn't mean Mark is free and clear just yet. Mark heads back to court in January of 2021, and hopefully the trial ends in a conviction this time. So in the meantime, here's what we do know about Kaylee, her relationship with Mark, and ultimately her untimely death. But first, I just want to add, there's very little information out there on this case. This means it could be harder to research and dive in as deep as I really would like to. With that being said, I'm pretty sure I've come across every article ever written and every video ever made of Kaylee. So I hope to do this story justice because God knows she deserves it. And so do her family and friends. So now that we know how the story ends, we need to start from the beginning. Even though there's not much out there about their relationship, except for the tension, fighting, and abuse. Come to find out, this wasn't even the first time Mark was accused of losing his cool during their short relationship. In fact, just about a month prior to Kaylee's death, on September 24th of 2017, Mark was charged with criminal mischief in the trashing of Kaylee's dorm room. Sources allege that the incident was possibly caused by roid rage as he's known to take and or sell steroids. 
During this incident, Mark also allegedly threatened to throw Kaylee off of her balcony. In another incident, it is alleged that he also assaulted Kaylee one evening. The arrest affidavit states that he grabbed her arm aggressively and threw her up against a brick wall during an argument. In another incident, about two weeks before her death, sources say that Kaylee confided in a friend that she was scared of Mark and that he had slammed her head into his car door window. In another incident, Mark allegedly took Kaylee's cell phone. When she tried to get her cell phone back, it's alleged that Mark became very aggressive towards Kaylee and this source is actually a source that seems to have been there at this altercation. This source states that Mark even went as far as to get out a gun of the glove box and he started waving it around and then threatened to shoot some fraternity brothers. I also know at some point, her ex-boyfriend is known to say Mark threatens suicide and he does it in a Snapchat message by putting this weapon of choice apparently either up to his mouth or in his mouth. So not only did he physically abuse Kaylee, but he mentally and emotionally abused her as well. Mark was well known around the Trinity campus, even though he was never a student at the school. After the trashing of Kaylee's dorm room, he was even banned for a whole year from the campus. Around this time, Kaylee confided in at least one friend on multiple occasions that she was again scared of Mark. According to the arrest affidavit, she also told a friend that she didn't know what else to do other than to give in to him. One of Kaylee's friends actually started asking Kaylee questions about some of the bruising and some of the alleged wounds that she had. And Kaylee said that they were from her abusive relationship with Mark. So what exactly happened that weekend to cause Mark to do what he allegedly did to Kaylee? That's definitely a lingering question that I have myself, but this is what I've been able to figure out thus far. So we start here. Mark alleges that he and Kaylee partied over the weekend while they attended the Malaluna Music Festival at the Wolf Stadium in San Antonio, Texas. Mark alleges that they became intoxicated on both October 28th and October 29th, the days of the festival. Mark also told law enforcement that they drank Crown Royal heavily, along with taking Molly, which is also known as MDMA, both of those days. Mark alleges that they got into an argument over an ex-boyfriend of Kaylee's on Sunday, the 29th, while at the music festival. And at this music festival, it appears that they all three ran into each other, Kaylee, the current boyfriend Mark, and the ex-boyfriend. Although Mark has proven to lie to law enforcement during some of his initial interviews, this part seems to at least match up with other accounts, including the one of the ex-boyfriend, who we know as Jet. Jet told law enforcement that he and Kaylee broke up about two months prior to the music festival. He also alleges that they were in the process of talking about possibly getting back together at this very time. And he even says that he saw an altercation take place between the two of them at the music festival. In this alleged altercation, Jet did not observe any injuries, but he did say that Mark aggressively grabbed Kaylee's arm as if to lead her out of the festival. Jet again says that this happened on that very day, October 29th. Mark alleges that you got into the car at this point to continue their argument. At some point, he tells law enforcement that they agree to drive back to Houston. Mark then alleges that they made up, even going as far as saying that Kaylee told him he was her soulmate and that she was trying to drop out of college to be with him. At this point, Mark continues on with his story and says that they pulled over at a Valero gas station just outside of San Antonio, Texas. And at this point, I guess they had makeup sex is what he says. And then at another point, he alleges that she was going to put her clothes back on after this relation that they had. And apparently she started to feel sick and ends up passing out in the seat and fails to put on her clothes and get dressed. Although he told law enforcement that she was going to basically run away with him, law enforcement didn't find much of Kaylee's in his car. When Mark was confronted with this information, he said he was going to buy her everything that she needed. Although we're not sure of much when it comes to timing that Sunday, we do know that according to the arrest affidavit, on that very same evening, 
Kaylee's roommate and close friend Morgan, tells law enforcement that she called her on FaceTime at approximately 8.30 p.m. She said even though she called Kaylee, that's not who answered. In fact, Mark is said to have answered that call, only to tell Morgan that Kaylee couldn't talk at that time. He then hung up on Morgan. Morgan told law enforcement Mark answered the phone from inside the car, but we're not exactly sure what she heard or might have even seen, being as that this was a FaceTime call and not just a phone call. I'm not sure if that call happened before or after Mark alleges that he started driving to Houston again, but at some point, that's what he initially tells police that they do. He admits to realizing at some point that Kaylee isn't breathing. He says he only noticed this just outside of Lulling, but who the hell knows at this point? Mark then tells law enforcement that he tried to perform CPR on Kaylee. And at some point during this very incident, an EMT is actually flagged down. And she says in court that Mark flagged her down while she was actually currently on a run with a patient. I see a gentleman that's hollering and screaming. I open the door, he's telling me that um, his girlfriend is not breathing. Hair was kind of matted, not, you know, um, had bruises on her. It's at this point, Kaylee ends up at the Seton Medical Center in very grave condition. Just one day later on October 30th of 2017, it's determined the damage done to Kaylee was far too extensive for recovery. The next day, October 31st of 2017, Kaylee is removed from life support. An autopsy later determines Kaylee was completely covered from head to toe in bruises and scratches. The only area of her body that was not beat to hell and back was her back and the back of her legs. The autopsy determined that Kaylee was in fact murdered and the arresting affidavit asserts that Mark is responsible for these crimes and that the relations that he said they had that fateful evening were far from consensual. It was ultimately determined that Kaylee died from blunt force trauma to the face and head, resulting in the formation of a large subdermal hematoma that caused the brain swelling and herniation to the brain. Kaylee's death was ruled a homicide. Now keep in mind, as I mentioned before, it took months before anyone even knew how Kaylee died and before a suspect was ever named. During this time, it's alleged that Mark was even brazen enough to confide in one friend with information about a burner phone that Mark insisted police missed due to it being hidden. Mark told his friend that he hid the cell phone in a planter at the hospital. He told this very same friend that he had lied to police about their relations that evening. He allegedly told his friend that he knew he choked her and even admitted to slapping her all with the new location at the center of the incident in this version of his events. This friend also told law enforcement that Mark told him he was unaware how long Kaylee really was not breathing. Another source alleges shortly after Kaylee's death, Mark told them just how Kaylee died from a subdermal hematoma Although he alleged that this happened from potential alcohol abuse and or an STD. Yeah, no, that's not what causes that. Anyway, in December of 2019, the case against Mark went to court with a jury of seven men and five women. Unfortunately, according to local news stations, the jury was deadlocked and couldn't get past an 8-4 vote. Eight people voting for a guilty conviction and four voting for an acquittal. After the jury told the judge they could not agree on whether to convict Mark or not, the judge told them to go back and try again, at which point they did. Unfortunately, they could not get past their eight to four split and a mistrial was then declared. Thankfully, a new trial has been scheduled for Mark, but as of the recording of this episode, it will not start until January of 2021. Although it absolutely blows my mind that there was a mistrial declared, I guess I wouldn't put anything past the court of law at this point in time. Mark's defense attorney was even said to basically say, yeah, I know this man is a jerk, but this trial isn't about this man being a jerk. His actions proved that this trial was all about proving anything but Mark could have caused 
this death. The defense even went as far as to call an expert up to say, it's possible that MDMA made the hematoma that much worse and that it's possible that the MDMA actually contributed to her death. But this expert was shaky at best, in my opinion. He couldn't even really give a solid answer. So, again, I'm paraphrasing here, but come the hell on. I wish I could just jam pack all the information that I found about Kaylee's death since I started looking into it into one episode. Honestly, I think I'd bore you to death, but I'm hoping to receive more official records and documents in the near future to continue my research into her untimely death. Regardless, I suppose we'll see what a court decides when Mark and his defense go up against a new jury. I truly hope that this time, Kaylee, along with her family and friends, get the justice that they deserve so very much. Now, one last thing before I go. I want to say if you know anything about domestic abuse and relationships, then you know the most dangerous time for someone in an abusive relationship is if and when they choose to leave their partner. In fact, the Clarion Ledger published an article in January of the year Kaylee died, quoting the executive director for the Mississippi Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And Miss Mahoney tells the Clarion Ledger, the statistics are that women in abusive relationships are about 500 many times more at risk when they leave. Domestic violence is all about power and control. And when a woman leaves, a man has lost his power and control. So with that being said, if you or a loved one is in an abusive relationship, please call 1-800-799-7233 and or go to their website at thehotline.org to chat with someone online and get more information. Thank you for tuning in. And if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and drop us a comment down below. We would love to know what you think of this case. Have you heard of this case before? Or do you have a similar story that you'd like to share with others? Comment below and we'll see you next time. I am truly sorry for anyone who didn't get the privilege to meet her. When I describe her today, I want to describe her as a person because I think that's what she would want. She was a person with flaws, but she was a person. And if I painted you a beautiful picture of her, I could be talking about anybody because nobody is perfect. She was perfectly imperfect. Kaylee's love in her heart affected some of her most amazing qualities. She was really accepting and supportive. Growing up, I really didn't have to deal with losing somebody that I cared about. I was very fortunate that way. Um, but my senior year of high school, a member of this youth group passed away. Kaylee was quite literally standing next to me when I got the news, and throughout the entire journey, she supported me. However, up until recently, I don't think I've ever experienced true mourning until now. A quality I really loved about her was her bold love. She didn't like try to hinder how much she loved people. Whenever she passed away, people would text me and say, how are you doing? And I don't know how to respond to that, so I just think, thank you for thinking of me. But I, met, I ran into one of my friends over Thanksgiving, and uh, she asked me how I was doing, and again, I kind of just avoided the question, but she said, Kaylee, I met her one time, the first time I ever met her, I felt like I'd been friends with her forever. I've never met somebody who was so welcoming and so loving, so quick. I think if she would have had more time here, that she would have infiltrated the world with her love, creating a difference. But thing is, is somehow she managed to fit a whole lifetime of love into 19 years. I think it's pretty awesome. And I don't think anybody in this room can say that they don't have room in their hearts to start loving people around them more. Maybe it's the smallest little thing to begin with, but I think everybody could say that they could strive to be a little bit more like her. Because we might have lost her, but we should not lose what was important to her.